listening to Muslimish Freethinkers, a podcast dedicated to fostering conversations on matters of faith and disbelief. Recording is ready. Welcome, everyone. We are excited Center for Inquiry Michigan and Muslimish Detroit, and very proud to bring you today's lecture titled Charles Darwin's Considerable Revolution in Natural History. Center for Inquiry is CFI Michigan. Uh, local branch of Center for Inquiry, an international, non-partisan, non-profit 501c3 organization whose mission statement is to foster a secular society based on reason, science, freedom of inquiry, and humanist values. CFI encourages evidence-based inquiry into science, pseudoscience, medicine and health, religion, ethics, secularism, and society. The Center for Inquiry is not affiliated with, nor does it promote any political party or political ideology. CFI Michigan is working to develop a secular community across the state where like-minded individuals can meet and share experiences. We host nearly 200 educational and social events each year, Event topics include science, religion, philosophy, social issues, politics, evolution, morality and ethics, psychology, secularism, atheism, humanism, agnosticism, skepticism, and others. We also have an active secular service program to provide CFI members with opportunities to put CFI's mission into action for the common good through community service and outreach. Muslimish Detroit is a part of Muslimish, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to create a safe, supportive, and open minded environment for the exchange of thoughts and ideas among current and former Muslims, to foster a pluralistic society that respects the rights of all individuals to live according to their conscience and to abolish blasphemy and apostasy laws across the globe. Muslimish was established in 2013 in New York and now functions in 12 chapters in North America. The abstract of the lecture is the following. We can dimly foresee, Charles Darwin promised in The Origins of Species, 1859, that there will be a considerable revolution in natural history when his scientific colleagues accepted evolution. He was not envisioning a revolution in religion or in philosophy, but rather in the explanation for patterns observed in the natural world. His overriding goal was, was to unite jumbled facts of natural history under general law. Darwin's considerable revolution did change the way we see the universe, but it originated in the unquenchable curiosity a working scientist felt about fossils and flowering plants and femurs and island faunas. Our speaker today is Professor Richard Bellin. Richard Bellin teaches history of science and science policy at Michigan State University. He has written extensively on the connection between science, politics, and social change in Britain from 1830 to 1870. He is author of A Sincere and Teachable Heart, Self-Denying Virtue in British Intellectual Life, 1736, to 1859, and his article titled, Inspiration in the Harness of Daily Labor, Darwin, Botany, and the Triumph of Evolution, 1859 to 1868, received the History of Science Society's 2013 
Derek Price, Rod Webster Prize for Excellence in a research article published in the journal ISIS. His current research project focuses on the history of American biology from the 1890s to the end of World War II. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Darwin's Day. In the beginning, the solar system revolved around the Earth, and humanity was carved from clay and bone, plopped, as it were, perfectly formed into a populated garden. Origin stories are, however, meant to be rewritten, and the reformation of central essential ideas about the nature of things meant and means challenging powerful ideologies and institutions. As was the case for earlier insights that resituated our view of our place in the cosmos, the study of naturalism and biology threatened to expose the mutability of the human species and jeopardize a theological stranglehold on scientific discovery. Stranglehold. The truth will out, as they say, and as Copernicus struggled to free the truth behind a heliocentric system, so too did Charles Darwin muster an immense intellectual bravery, a perpetual curiosity, and a ravenous hunger for truth in an attempt to understand the origins of modern life. Breakthroughs in understanding our own origins would require setting aside prevailing cosmological and anthropocentric views. They would necessitate, necessitate a commitment to the scientific method and the potentially disconcerting facts that may arise from its rigor. Empiricism in the field of biology and its immense potential benefits to human well-being had for centuries been stimied in order to maintain theological tenets. The fantastic realization behind the interconnectedness of the living world and the biological mechanisms that inform adaptation and survival were hidden behind the dark veil awaiting discovery. Darwin's daring depictions of evolution via genetic variation and natural selection lift the veil revealing what, at the time, and for some presently, may have been philosophically or ideologically troubling. His innovations are, when seen through the dispassionate lens of scientific data, however, neither inherently good nor bad, merely properly sourced and factual. The repercussions of these discoveries are wide-ranging and awe-inspiring. Darwin's life and work continuously impact science and humanity. His discovery of natural selection as the mechanism for evolution unclasped scientific progress from theological limitations and paved the way for a fuller understanding of our place in the universe. Without the discovery of natural selection, the greatest achievements in health, philosophy, and human well-being over the past 200 years would have been impossible. While Darwin's remarkable impact on biology, cosmology, and the scientific process generally cannot be understated, it is again his undeniable desire for truth through scientific discovery, his unwavering curiosity to discover that which was hidden, and his determination to brave intellectual depth that inspire us. Ever since Charles Darwin published his radically insightful book on the origins of species, Darwin on the origin of species, Darwin has been the focus of commemorations and tributes by scientists, artists, scholars, and free thinkers throughout the world. From the early gatherings after his death at his own townhouse to bicentennial events all over the globe celebrating science and humanity within our various cultures internationally has been a resonant and transcendent pursuit. In 1909, on the 100th anniversary of his birth, large celebrations honoring Darwin's contributions to science and humanity were held in Cambridge, New York, and New Zealand. The University of Chicago commemorated the 100th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species in 1959 with a series of notable events from November 24th through the 28th. The 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth saw an entire season of BBC programming on Charles Darwin himself, as well as evolution and natural selection. Salem State University has successfully held an annual Darwin festival since 1980. 
The organized movement to establish an annual International Darwin Day celebration began with three Darwin enthusiasts. Dr. Robert Stevens, who motivated the humanist community in Silicon Valley to initiate an annual Darwin Day celebration in 1995. Professor Massimo Bigliusi, who similarly organized annual Darwin Day events at the University of Tennessee beginning in 1997. And Amanda Shusworth, who joined Stevens to officially incorporate the Darwin Day program in New Mexico in the year 2000. The Darwin Day program was reincorporated two years later in California as the Darwin Day Celebration, a 501c3 nonprofit educational corporation promoting public education about science and encouraging the celebration of science and humanity throughout the global community. Darwin Day Celebration also established an advisory board of prominent scientists to provide assistance on questions of scientific importance. Today is Darwin Day the birthday of an extraordinary scientist who asked some bold little questions about the origins of life. Why and how? So much of what we know about our place in the universe rests on Charles Darwin's questions and his courage in publishing answers. The importance of questioning cannot be understated. In fact, every new leak traveled on the moral arc of justice rests on the contributions of questioners equally brave. I myself have been influenced so greatly by Charles Darwin. It may be, or the theory of evolution through natural selection, one of the most influential things in my life. As an engineering student, I had the, I had the least exposure to biology and less exposure to the theory of evolution. Growing first in the Middle East where the theory is pretty much dismissed and discussing it is frowned upon or questioned suspiciously, I heard no mention of it in any science class or anywhere else. I also was a student of Islamic studies who de dedicated a big portion of his youth studying and teaching Islam's theology, history, jurisprudence, Quran and Hadith. The subject of evolution was not present anywhere in Islamic studies naturally. Nevertheless, a discipline that positioned you, the, 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 the Islamic studies discipline positions you supposedly to answer any question from a religious audience and does not train you to say, I don't know, as much as training you on finding answers from the traditional sources. Hence, when an imam was asked about the theory of evolution in front of me by one of the members of the congregation, the answer I usually heard was, son, this is a theory that has been disproved long time ago and is no longer considered valid. A complete false, I came to later realize. What exposed me to the theory of evolution and caused me to change my understanding of life altogether was a question in 2008 that we received. It coincide, coincided with the discovery of the fossil Lucy. Lucy is the common name of AL288-1, that's the name of the fossil, which is several hundred pieces of bone fossils representing 40% of a skeleton of a female of the hominin species, Astroplopithecus afarensis, discovered in Ethiopia in 1974, and dated to about 3.2 million years ago using the potassium argon radiometric dating method. The fossil assembly and research was completed by 2007, from 1974 till 2007. 33 years of scientific work, including a 13-year suspension of the research due to the lack of dating technology, and it toured the United States for six years after the book was published in 2007. I was then the chairman of the Religious Institute for Religious Studies, Humanities, and Dialogue, and was asked the question about Lucy, what is Islam's opinion, what is Islam's opinion about Lucy? I could not find the answer within the Islamic uh, sources, and the scholars, members of the organization, members of the jurisprudence committee did not have much answers either. Nothing was satisfactory, so I started my research called Islam and Evolution and ended up opening Pandora's box. Once I understood evolution, the empirical argument from beauty fell, the argument from design fell, and the way I see the word, 
fell, and I started seeing the world through a scientific lens, a beautiful lens. More made me see the world as a more wonderful place, actually. As Richard Dawkins says in Unweaving the Rainbow, I believe that an orderly universe, one indifferent to human preoccupations, in which everything has an explanation, even if we still have a long way to go before we find it, is a more beautiful, more wonderful place than a universe tricked out with capricious ad hoc magic. I would like to start the program by the following invocation read uh, on, on Darwin, uh, actually written by, ah, I don't have the name, but it's not by me, but it's invocation for Darwin's day. On Darwin's birthday, let us find ourselves inspired to stretch our minds with questions that test our limits. Let us champion the values of intellectual bravery perpetual curiosity and hunger for truth. Let us honor scientific thinkers like Darwin, not just in our laboratories, but in the practice of nurturing compassionate, egalitarian communities that value free inquiry. Let us work to grow our understanding of the interconnectedness of all life and expand our empathy and the reach of our compassion. And like Darwin himself, let us take daring risks for a freer, fairer, and more joyful world. Without further ado, I would like to present to you Dr. Richard to speak for 45 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. Dr. Richard, welcome to the podium. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, thank you for the invitation. I am really pleased to be here to talk about Darwin, to share a little bit of my research um, with you. And I want to start tonight with a name that I'm reasonably certain that nobody other than me has ever heard of before. The Reverend Charles Dobin. In fact, nobody outside of a handful of historians of science has mostly been sort of forgotten today. Although in his um, during his life in the 19th century, he was born 1795, he died in 1870. He was a very accomplished, very important natural science. So he was, by the end of his life, a professor of botany and also rural economy at the University of Oxford. And as a matter of course, being an Oxford professor also means that you are a clergyman in the Church of England. So he is the Reverend uh, Charles Doherty. And in fact, at the time, and this was a point of severe controversy, that in Oxford, only, only members of the Church of England could attend as students. So it was a very much an Anglican uh, sort of university. And whether it should be opened up to other uh, people of other denominations was an incredible sort of controversy. I just bring that up to point out that Darwin was not the only point of controversy in the 19th century. The 19th century in Britain was a wash with a whole range of, of political and religious and cultural and social sort of conflicts. And so the Reverend uh, Dobini, as a scientist, was certainly going to be very interested in the work of Sir Charles Darwin. And I want to bring up the presidential address that he delivered on June 28, 1865, to the Devonshire Association for the Advancement of Science, Literature, and Art. Just uh, a bit of sort of chronology that The Origin of Species, a Darwin's a landmark book, was published in November of 1859. So Dominic's talk um, would have taken place by the, a little, about five and a half years after the publication of The Origin of Species. Now, in the course of his talk, he starts out by noticing the incredible progress of science during his lifetime, noting that in all of human history, he had not seen such an expansion of the knowledge of the laws of nature, nor the increased power that humans had by applying those laws to practical things. 
He uh, then talks about a number of recent scientific uh, discoveries, mostly in geology. And so I would imagine if you're going to be reading this on the page, you probably figure maybe can get the minutes into it. He starts talking about Charles Darwin. Now remember, he's the Reverend Dobie. And in fact, uh, by the time he dies, he never accepts the theory of evolution. And so you might think that what he's going to do is he's going to wind up to, to make a very angry denunciation of Darwin's theory. That did not happen. Now, he made it clear that he has some scientific, um, scientific quibble with Darwin, particularly in kind of gaps in the fossil records as well. Now, you know, this is a problem for this theory. He also makes it clear, and here he's talking as much as a clergyman, he's talking as much as a clergyman as is the scientist to say that he is disturbed by any kind of theory that would posit that human rationality could be explained merely by material forces. And yet, he also says something really quite important, because remember, he's somebody that can evaluate Darwin's theory on a technical, on a technical basis. And so to the, assembled, uh, the people assembled for the annual meeting, um, he says, even to its most determined opponents, ought to indulge an indulgent feeling, feeling towards a theory which has guided Darwin into a train of discoveries, both as to the vegetable and animal kingdom, any one of which would be sufficient to establish the reputation of an ordinary observer. So this is really, I think, important and really kind of interesting. That he's still maintaining his distance from the evolution, but at the same time, he said that Darwin is a really good scientist. And even more than that, he said that Darwin, by, by carrying out his, his theorizing on the origin of species, this has allowed him to make a lot of discoveries. Now, Dolby, I think, should be a big part of the Darwin story. This is a really important statement by somebody, though forgotten today, who had a very significant kind of perch, perch in British science. But he's not, I think one of the reasons why he's not remembered so much today is this does not fit into our comfortable narratives of sort of Darwin, this grand clash between science and religion, and all of the philosophical and religion, religious and metaphysical and political and cultural implications of Darwinism. And I'm not going to say that those aren't important. They certainly are. And they certainly were something that were central to the kind of reception of Darwin's ideas right from the very beginning, very early after the reception, a great statement by uh, George Henry Lewis, so February 1861, so a little bit more than a year after the publication of The Origin, he writes that the Darwinian hypothesis is clamorously rejected by conservative minds because it is thought to be revolutionary, and not less eagerly accepted by insurgent minds because it is thought destructive of all doctrine. And so that's certainly true, that a lot of the reception of Darwin was grounded in what were the kind of the cultural politics of the time. And this was the time of the intense cultural politics between the conservatives and the insurgents. It's also something, these religious issues that surround Darwin are something that's very much with us today, of course. Although I would kind of emphasize that when we think about modern American creationism, the default is to put this into a narrative of science versus religion. But if you look at kind of the rise of a distinct American creationism, and these debates are still with us today, what we see is not so much science and religion colliding. What we see is an internecine conflict within American Protestantism between the kind of liberal, we today recognize a couple more liberal theology, you know, in the early 20th century, a sort of modernist theology, versus the fundamentalists. And so in my current research, I'm looking at kind of American biology in the first half of the 20th century, kind of an interesting moment um, in these sort of debates. Uh, it takes place in New York City, uh, 1922, Harry Emerson Fostick, one of these very prominent, very popular um, modernist theologians gives a sermon, shall the fundamentalists win? So very much uh, skeptical, as you would imagine, of, of, 
of a fundamentalist theology that he saw as inconsistent with kind of a, a true reading of the Bible. And across town, also in New York City, a few months later, um, John Rose Stratton, a very kind of prominent, nationally prominent um, fundamentalist, uh, got into his pulpit and asked the question, shall the funny monkey is And so evolution gets kind of sucked into these debates between, between different uh, understandings of sort of American sort of Protestantism. And I think that's kind of an important thing to recognize. But it's also something that now that I'm going to talk about it briefly, I'm going to step back and not talk about kind of these religious implications because I really want to, well, to explore kind of Darwin's life in the way that Darwin would himself want it explored, or what he would see it as his real legacy. And it's, it's not somebody who was a profound thinker on metaphysics or religion, although Darwin was aware his theories had these metaphysical religious implications and he did think about it. But he was fundamentally a scientist. He was fundamentally like uh, Charles Dobby, somebody who wanted to understand the basics of patterns of the natural world. And so I'm going to explore some of his career then as a scientist to explain where his theory came from, uh, what kind of evidence he uh, drew to develop his ideas, and then also how he sort of extended his ideas of evolution into other types of research programs. And so let's begin in that story in the uh, so 1820s uh, at Cambridge University. He was a student in Christ College. And to be honest, and I think Darwin would have acknowledged this when he turned up, he was not a particularly impressive student. In fact, the head of Christ College thought that he was basically one of those very common Cambridge students who would show up, spend their time hunting and getting drunk, and then panic at the last minute to, to drag themselves over the finish line when it comes time to study for their exam. And so Darwin does not show a great deal of sort of academic progress early in his uh, career at Cambridge. But that changes when he becomes under the wing of very, a, a very accomplished and very charismatic uh, science professors. And none more so than the young, the very talented, very charismatic John Stephen Henslow. He was the professor of uh, botany. To the point where Darwin became got the nickname the man who walked with Henslow. I mean, you could almost picture Henslow going into Darwin Hall, you know, after him almost in, in puppy dog style. He really um, found his sort of calling in sort of natural sort of history. He already had this interest before he came to Cambridge, but really blossoms under the tutelage of Henslow and then other professors at Cambridge. Um, the geology professor Adam Sedgwick, um, the kind of the, the resident philosopher of science, uh, William Huell. Um, he also, when he was at Cambridge, becomes associated, becomes uh, familiar with some really important books that kind of change his life, and by changing his life, kind of change his science. And so in his autobiography, he said, During my last year at Cambridge, I read with care and profound interest Alexander von Humboldt's personal narrative. This work, and Sir John Herschel's introduction to the study of natural philosophy, stirred up in me a burning zeal to add even the most humble contribution to the noble structure of natural science. No one or a dozen other books influenced me nearly as much as those two. And I'm going to talk briefly about these two books, because again, these help kind of make it really clear kind of what was motivating of Darwin throughout his life. Now, uh, Alexander von Humboldt, a great German naturalist, um, a long, decade-long sort of career, very sort of productive scientific thought, but ultimately was most famous for the expedition he took to Central, uh, to South America from 1799 to 1804. And then he uh, wrote a number of books about this, but the kind of international bestseller that really uh, captured Darwin was his personal narrative. This is both rigorous science, but also grand adventure. So Darwin wanted to partake in that, in, in that adventure. And uh, Humboldt had, you know, Humboldt was not somebody who just went out into nature and, you know, and simply sort of 
reflecting or observing sort of random. He had a, a goal. My sole true object is to investigate the confluence and interweaving of all physical forces and the influence of dead nature on animate, animal, and plant creation. So how does everything fit together? How does the climate interact with the distribution of species? How do species interact with each other? So these are all really kind of profound questions. And the kind of central to this is not to look at, at different parts of nature isolation, but put them all together as part of a grand whole. So Darwin found this extraordinarily uh, inspiring. The other individual, uh, John Herschel, most famous as an astronomer, um, but did a wild array of different scientific achievements. Also, well, one of the, the best mathematicians of the 19th century. And his work, The Preliminary Discourse on the Study of Natural Philosophy, I think is, is, is his masterpiece. It sets out what it means to do science. How, and he doesn't mean it just in a technical sense, but he also means this, what does it mean in a moral sense? And Darwin very much absorbs this moral mission as well. At the very beginning of this book, Herschel writes, that there is something in the contemplation of general laws which powerfully persuades us to urge individual feelings and to commit ourselves unreservedly to their disposal. While the observation of the calm, energetic regularity of nature, the immense scale of our operations, and the certainty which her ends are attained, tends irresistibly to tranquilize and reassure the mind and render it less accessible to repining, selfish, and turbulent emotion. So that's in its kind of fancy 19th century way of saying that science and understanding not just science, scientific objects in isolation, but the grand influence of natural laws trains the mind, not just intellectually, but morally. It gives you patience. It gives you a calm that is central to being in science. Darwin is very much inspired uh, by this as well. And it's this inspiration that he takes with him on the event that he um, would claim in his autobiography could have made his career. Through the intercession of his own able to get a position as um, a naturalist aboard HMS Beagle. So from 1831 to 1836, he circumnavigates the globe. Most of the time is being spent in South America. Now, as an aside, this is very much an imperial project. This, it, this, this surveying mission of the coast of South America takes place after the revolution in South America. So the British military, now that the Spanish and the Portuguese are kind of have lost their colonies, the British are, are, are trying to move in not to become the new colonial overlords, but at least to have kind of knowledge about the uh, you know cartographic knowledge that they can use to protect British so the interests. So so it's it's this great imperial adventure. And Darwin is able essentially to tangle. And so when he when he does and as he does this he um, very much sort of makes his reputation. I mean, in a in one sort of way, you can almost see this as the 19th century equivalent of graduate school. You know, he got he has an undergraduate degree. This is grad school. This is where you move from a young promising student to an actual practicing naturalist. And his colleagues back in England, even during the war, were very impressed with what he was able to accomplish. His professor of geology, Adam Sedgwick, writes to Darwin's old. A high school teacher, he says that Darwin is doing admirable work in South America and has already sent home a collection above all price. If God spares his life, and actually going out and circumnavigating the globe on a tiny ship is actually a dangerous business, but if God spares his life, he will have a great name among the naturalists of the world. And so, one of the things that makes this voyage so important for Darwin is not just it gives him a lot of opportunities to do some things like coral reefs or to collect fossils and plants and animals, although that's all very, very so important. It gives him the opportunity over the course of years to observe some basic sort of patterns in the natural world. And this is really important because he, remember he learns from, from Humboldt, he learns from Herschel, that what scientists do is you want to try to find out how do you tie all these patterns together, not to see, see the phenomena of the natural world as, as in isolation, 
but try to explain it through kind of increasingly general laws. And so one of the things that Darwin, of course, is aware of is these issues of biological function. Now, in the, in the kind of the science of the, of the first part of the 19th century, particularly in Britain, that biological function has a pretty straightforward explanation. God created individual species. And you might, before you think, well, this is just superstition, you actually, I, I would say that, that this is not particular, that this is not irrational at all. That if you think about even something as simple as a blade of grass, how nicely designed, or apparently designed, to fulfill its function. You can think of things like our eye, our hands, all these other contrivances we see in the uh, natural world. Even today, after scientists who are thoroughgoing evolutionists will still talk in terms of design. And so it does make a certain amount of sense as well, as one important sort of thing you pointed out. Uh, you can't have design without a designer. So biological function seems to point to the existence of somebody capable of designing that function. Okay, that's fair enough. But one of the things that, that Darwin is observing, and again, he's not alone in observing this, but he really thinks on this quite hard, is a number of instances where the functional explanation is far from su sufficient to explain the patterns that we see in the natural world. So for example, uh, there are structural relationships in the anatomy of uh, species that cannot be explained purely on functional, uh, 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 functional explanation. There are spatial relationships, the relationship of different species in space that don't make any particular sense from a purely functional explanation. And then finally, there are these temporal relationships, relationships of species in time. Again, that that try to uh, try to explain these merely in terms of design and function it doesn't work. These patterns don't reduce function. And so I'm going to go through each of these sort of in turn to kind of illustrate the type of things that Darwin was encountering and he was trying to explain. Now, in terms of patterns of structure, one of the things that um, scientists well before Darwin recognized is the existence of what we call sort of homology. That fact that you have, a, you have the, the same basic structure across many different species, but serving very different functional sort of purposes. I mean, in this case, you can see the wings of a bat and the flippers of a manatee. And if you count up the number of bones and you count up the arrangement of the bones, it's the same. The bones have been, so maybe not been, so they have been sort of modified for that purpose, but you have this basic plan that ties together the wings and the flippers. And in fact, what you can see is this plan is something that, that runs entirely through kind of vertebrates. Uh, this is an illustration of, of uh, four wings. You can see the human hand. You can see the four wings of dogs, hogs, sheep, horses. And in each of these species, what you see are these same patterns replicating themselves again and again. Now, they would be modified for the particular needs of my hand to, uh, to grasp or the needs of the dog or the needs of the horse. But you see, in all of these cases, these, these commonalities. Even something where you think that there would be very little commonality between our arms and the, the front legs of the horse would, be, would you think be very different. We see these patterns. In fact, science is still discovering these patterns. Uh, up until very recently, one of the differences that scientists would say that you would find in this between the four limbs of a horse and the, and the four limbs of humans is we have kind of five digits where horses only have three. I mean, the hoof is mostly just a big middle finger and there's some small digits on the other side. However, I was just reading two days ago in the New York Times where scientists have looked at the embryological development in horses and actually very early in the embryological development of horses, what do you see? Why did two of them will eventually uh, be lost during the point of development? So again, from a functional point of view, you can't really explain this because there's no, indeed there's by definition no functional 
purpose would be two rudimentary sort of digits that then sort of disappear early in the development process. So that's something that Darwin and other scientists are noticing, and that's how Darwin explained it to himself in, in one of his uh, essays. Nothing, there's nothing more wonderful in natural history than looking at the vast number of organisms, recent and fossil. So you don't see this just in living organisms, you of course see this in, in, in uh, extinct ones as well, exposed to the most diverse environmental conditions, living in the most distant climates, and at immensely remote periods, fitted to wholly different ends, and yet find large groups united by a similar type of structure. So that's an interesting thing. How do you explain that? Well, that's one of the things that Darwin is dealing with. But you also see patterns of space. And you can, and Darwin encountered this kind of firsthand, very much uh, on the beam. Now, take one of the places they stop, the topic is like, well, I guess, of course, it's, it is profoundly associated with Charles Darwin. And one of the things that Darwin noticed, go to the Galapagos Islands, um, and this is the type of thing that was verified by scientists back in London, that most of the species that you find in the Galapagos Islands, whether they're plants, whether they're birds, other types of animals, both of these species exist nowhere else. They're unique to the Galapagos. Okay, well, that's interesting. But another thing you notice that these species, though they are unique, they are most similar to the species on the South American main. The South American main might actually have a different climate, and these are clearly different species. But if you uh, carry out the work of taxonomy where you're putting species together uh, by uh, relationship, if you want to see the species, these unique species in the Galapagos are most closely related, to species that are occupying a different environment, but very close to life in the United States. And it's not just the law, because you see exactly the same thing in the, um, you can see the same thing off the coast of Africa, that you, um, there you have a kind of archipelago where the species are unique, but similar to those from the African sort of environment. But also if you look at the environments, the environments of these islands, these oceanic islands are very similar, but they have very different species. And the species they do have are not related to each other, they're related to the ones that they're close to in physical proximity. That's, that's interesting, that's interesting. And so, from Darwin's point of view, we clearly, we here clearly see that mere geographical proximity affects more than any relation of adaptation to the character of the species. So species, well, in the long story short, tend to be most similar to the species that they're closest to uh, geographically. Now one of the, the things I'd also point out is the Galapagos frog. Have you heard of the frog? Anybody heard of the Galapagos frog? No, I have. Well, okay, forget it. Because there is no Galapagos frog. There, in fact, are no amphibians at all on the Galapagos Islands. It's not because the environment is unsuited for amphibians. The fact is very much suited for amphibians. Just don't see the Galapagos. And that's also interesting. And again, this is something that's not unique to the Galapagos. You see this in these ge uh, geologically known oceanic islands. Don't have amphibians. That's interesting. Right? And so, notice that Darwin at this point isn't, isn't coming up with explanations for all this, but he's noting these types of, these types of patterns. And so, in terms of these patterns, of the book, I guess you have the environment differs from that of the South American mainland, but most of the species, most of the species of the Galapagos are endemic, and so that's nowhere else on Earth. The plants, birds, reptiles, and mammals native to the Galapagos mostly closely resemble the species in the South American anyway, and there aren't any amphibians. So we can hold on to that and we'll see why all this is important. Now the other pattern is a temporal patterns, patterns in time. And so just one really nice example of this is my daughter is absolutely mad at sloth. So she has to pick one and pick what it uses to be tend to be like sloth. So I get this sloths are awesome. And so one of the things that Darwin was able to discover I'm um, again not the first person to discover, um, but had certainly expanded the, the, uh, our knowledge of these extinct large brown spots. 
Uh, one that he discovered becomes Bible Don Darwinii, a sloth who's uh, seven foot uh, six inches. He also collected some uh, Megatherium, even bigger. If you're ever in London, this is at the National uh, History Museum, wonderful place. I would highly recommend it. Um, and so these are remarkable creatures. They're clearly, it's, they're full of inside swallows who wander around South America. I think we, we kind of build them. But what's interesting is where you find these extinct sloths, you find them exactly in the range of the living sloths. And again, this is something that's not unique to sloths. This is something you see again and again in sort of nature. And we see extinct animals, particularly recently extinct animals, that, they, that they, the fossils are located where very similar living animals exist. So there is this relationship in time, similar to the relationship that we see in space. And it's also, and this is essential, in fact, the very practice of geology in today, and certainly in the 19th century, is that the more ancient any form is, the more, as a general rule, it differs from living forms. So if you go down the geological column, go deeper and deeper into time, the more weird the species become, the more they depart from the species today. The younger the fossils, the, closer, the more closely they are that is the same creature. It's an interesting pattern. And so these are the types of things that Darwin very much has on his mind. Um, the Beagle returns to England October 1836. Uh, Darwin would, in fact, never again leave England um, for the rest of his life. Uh, and he gets back first in Cambridge, then in London, and then uh, moves into kind of rural, a rural uh, a village called Down outside of London, and begins this period of intense kind of speculation. At this point, where he tries to help make sense of these patterns. And this is here where he convinces himself finally in evolution. That's what's really. Uh, so, and so he takes these issues of, say, the Galapagos Island. Well, what's going on here? Well, it could be that God just decided to create species on the Galapagos Island that are similar to those in the South American mainland. Um, he may have just never gotten around to creating amphibians. You know, it's seven days of creation. You only have so much time, I suppose. But no, that Darwin, that doesn't seem to make sense. It doesn't make a lot more sense. Species from South America find their way somehow to the Galapagos Islands and then begin to evolve into new species. That's the explanation. Why no amphibians? Well, you can see how reptiles or plants, but certainly birds, would get from South America to the Galapagos. But how do you get something like an amphibian? Well, amphibians, given their kind of biological nature, trying to, to cross that huge boundary of water simply wasn't so possible. So here you can see that the patterns that you, the, 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 how you would explain the patterns would be sort of evolution, there's a change. This is um, the type of thing that Darwin really begins to kind of work through. Um, he also is really, wants to emphasize how you would explain these patterns in terms of natural law. Now, Newton got to explain the planets on the basis of natural law. Geologists got to explain the history of the Earth through the process of natural law. Why not biology? And actually, one of the things that, that if you are a historian of, of Darwin, you recognize the guy had absolutely appalling sort of handwriting. But what he's writing down here is, is quite interesting. He says, we can allow satellites, planets, universes, indeed whole systems of universes, to be governed by law, but the smallest insects we wish to be created at once by a special act. Why not? If we can explain the origin of plants and geology and chemistry, all the insects for the operation of natural law, why can't we explain what why can't we explain the origin of species by the operation of natural law rather than by a continuous series of ad hoc interventions like that. You don't, you don't expect God out there winding up the winding up Saturn around the sun. Why do we have to, to explain insects in quite that same way? And so Darwin, during this period, he begins to be, he begins to, to think very hard about well, there is evolution, but drives evolution. 
How many say that things are false? How many say why are they? And here, an encounter with a, a political economist, Malthus is absolutely central. Malthus's argument at the end of the 18th century, kind of responding to the kind of political uh, crisis of the French Revolution, so essentially argued that humans are all never can be human society is always going to be fairly miserable because humans are always going to have more children than the environment can sustain. And if you think about how. If you think about the patterns of reproduction, if, if, if I have three children, and my children have three children, each of those children have three, you know, things, population will grow exponentially, but we don't have the environment to sustain that. And, and, and all this is talking about this in human terms. But Darwin is making quite the, the easy sort of leap to say, well, if you have this exponential growth in terms of human population, you certainly clearly have it in an animal or plant population which, unlike humans, don't have any opportunity to actually um, govern their, their, their sort of reproduction. And so, in The Origin of Species, he explains, well, let's take the elephant. It's the slowest breeding of all animals that we know. That, he says, that it'll breed at 30 years old, and it'll keep breeding for the next 60 years, and it'll have maybe three offspring. So this is, this is, elephants are not creatures that pump out a lot of offspring. Is the point. And yet, based on this natural increase, if you take one pair of elephants, at the end of uh, 500 years, you'd have 15 million elephants. Even this really slow breeding animal would outbreed this environment. So this is elephants. So we imagine, of course, rabbits or any other type of animal that breeds at a much, much higher rate. And so Darwin begins to say, well, if most elephants are born are not going to be able to survive. Those who survive are going to be those that, on average, are better adapted to their environment. So this becomes a natural selection. As he explains in The Origin, can it be thought improbable, seeing that variations useful to man have undoubtedly occurred, that other variations useful in some way, each being in the great and complex battle of life, can sometimes occur in the course of thousands of generations. If such do occur, can we doubt? Remember that many more individuals were born than could possibly survive, that individuals having any advantage, longer neck, perhaps a little bit faster, sharper teeth, better teeth for a particular type of diet, any type of, of, of advantage you can imagine, would they have the best chance of surviving and procreating their kind? On the other hand, we may feel sure that any variation in the least degree injurious would be rigidly destroyed. This preservation of favorable variations and the rejection of the injurious variations I call natural selection. So you can see how these kind of attachment to these patterns lead to this really kind of fun, what is the most important theory, perhaps in the history of science, certainly in the history of biology. And so it was in the origin of species of 1859 where he sets out a sketching something. He sees this actually more of an abstract of the series pages, but um, he sees this as kind of maps. He sets out his theory, um, it deals with um, his various components, talks about the patterns, talks about geological pattern, describes um, artificial selection of humans, a whole range of different issues, talks about difficulties that his theory, that he admits that his theory uh, perhaps can't entirely explain. And it's also at the end of the origin, where I got today's title. So this is, he's in the conclusion, so we want five more pages to go, where he says something quite interesting. He says, when the views entertained in this volume on the origin of species, or when analogous views are generally admitted, we can deeply foresee that there will be a considerable revolution in natural history. So he says, this, this is a big deal. This is going to change how we understand sort of life, the grand patterns of life, so giving overarching general law to explain biological patterns that before were, that we were unable to sort of explain scientifically. But what comes next is also is interesting, systems. And so these are people who would describe and classify species, so what species, genus, family, you know, assign species um, within the kind of the taxonomic hierarchy, describe them, give them names. Systematists will be able to pursue their labors as at present. But they will not be incessantly haunted by the shadowy doubt of this or that form being the essence of species. And so he 
and say, oh, there might be a big revolution, but the guys, the way that we're already doing science, we can keep doing science the way that we've always been doing science to just be able to do it with a better explanation. So that's the point that he made. He was optimistic. He writes to his best friend, Joseph Booker, um, right before the origin comes out, we shall soon be a good body of working men. He emphasized working men, people who are original researchers. And shall have, I am convinced, all the young and rising naturalists on our side. So Darwin was optimistic. For a range of reasons, his optimism, at least initially, was in his place. A huge amount of abuse just rained down on his poor head, uh, including from people that he once considered to be colleagues and friends. An incredibly nasty review came from Richard Owen, who at the time, probably even more so than Darwin, would have been recognized as Britain's greatest living biologist. Um, and he savages Darwin's theory. He doesn't just say it's wrong, but he, he sneers that Darwin was not one of those naturalists who troubled the intellectual world a little with their beliefs, but enriched greatly with their proofs. Basically, what he's saying is that Darwin is clogging up science with these vain speculations instead of going out and doing real research the way that real scientists do and the way that Darwin once did before he went off on, on his tangent that Darwin is just out there. He's in his way of speculation. This is nasty. This broke up their friendship and they never spoke after this review. Um, Owen also coached one of the most um, kind of prominent clergymen of the era, the Bishop of Oxford, Sam Wilberforce, Sir Sam. He was uh, he was commonly known. And he writes a, also an excoriating review. These are in my major periodicals. These are not reviews that are in my out of the way. These are in the Edinburgh Review, the uh, Quarterly Review. The, the most important sort of, the most important sort of intellectual um, journals of the age. And, and Wilberforce also sneers that Darwin abandoned the sober, patient, philosophical courage of our home philosophy. That Mr. Darwin should have wandered from the broad highways of nature's work into the jungle of fanciful assumption is no small evil. So he says he's a bad scientist, he's not even really very English. So that's you know, there's a little insult going on there. And Darwin actually was pretty disheartened because for a lot of reasons that this criticism really stuck. And he wrote to Hooker, uh, his great confidant, 1863. So he's been out for several years. And he says, well, I, I do not believe there are, there are above half a dozen real downright believers in evolution in all of England. Certainly not more than dare speak out. Now, when he wrote this, although Darwin, I don't think it was clearly not aware of it, the tide was already starting to turn. And one of the things that turns the tide is the book that he writes after the And it's a book that, I mean, if, if you really want to take the orchid species to the beach, you can. You know, you can. It's, 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 it's the kind of thing that you can read on the beach. I mean, okay, it may be not the impression of the novel, but, you know, it's, it, 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 it's accessible, it's interesting uh, to the lay reader. The next book, if you could find a copy, do not take it to the beach. On the various contrivances by which British and foreign orchids are fertilized by insects and good effects of intercrossing. <gasps> I mean, <laughs> and, and I'm getting bored, I'm just reading the title. And so what Darwin does in this book is he deals with the major problem of the reproduction, the, the, the reproduction of flowering plants. And one of the things basically he shows, long story short, it, or he really shows us other kinds of what, what orchids are common in his great case study, that orchids are, or, orchids are, or most orchids are dramatic, so they can sell fertilizers. But they almost never do. And in fact, you can see, as the title indicates, that orchids, the, the floral morphology, the floral anatomy of, of, of the of, of orchid flowers is, to use this word, designed, seems beautifully designed, it seems contrivance to promote cross fertilization by insects. Now, the particular form of the flower depends on the insect pollinators. And so one of the things that Darwin does is not just show that orchids are almost always cross fertilized, and most scientists didn't recognize this, but we can really understand this by looking at the structure of the flowers and understanding this in evolutionary terms. 
the way that these uh, that you have thousands of orchid species, and they basically sort of radiate outward uh, based on these reproductive needs. So it's a really nice use uh, evolution to explain a really interesting problem in technical sort of botany: how do flowering plants reproduce? After, after Darwin's evolutionary botany in the early part of the 1860s, scientists know so much more about this. And then Darwin would be the first to point out that not that he is a more knowledgeable or even better biologist than all these other biologists who didn't recognize this. What's the difference? Well, he makes it quite clear. I had a theory that allowed me to see more deeply into these several relationships than other botanists did. Um, one of the, and so, as he explained this to his really close friend, the American botanist Lisa Gray, he said that no one else has perceived that the difference in my working book has been a flank movement on the enemy. What does that mean? Instead of a frontal attack on religion and metaphysics, he just goes around. He flanks them by talking about these technical issues. And most people, let's be honest, probably don't care all that much about the reproductive biology of flower plants. But man, if you do care about this, this is good stuff. And it also reorients the debate over monkey brains and our relationship to, to, to animals and all of these really hot button cultural issues to a type of technical science in which scientists can debate amongst themselves. Now, Dobeny, to go to, to return to, uh, to, to him, was very impressed by this. And again, he's a botanist and he recognizes it. He cares about these issues and he recognizes the technical brilliance of what Darwin was able to do. So 1862, this is even three years before that first book that I, that I started with, he's at the British, the annual meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. This is the major meeting for science in Britain at the time. So this is huge. Not just scientists, but the general public, journalists are there. And he gets up and he tells his audience, he says, you know, people are slightly on Darwin, so he read it, read it, because it was important to Darwin's reputation as it would dispel many notions which had been wrong, wrongly entertained with regards to the tendency of this writing. So what do you say? If you want to say that Darwin is this foamy atheist, you're wrong. And Orkin will show you that he still don't necessarily believe in evolution. Oh, this is good science. And also one of the things that this work does is it brings in these young scientists that Darwin wanted to attract right from the very beginning. And this is just like a partial list, but if you go through it, you can identify, identify so many kind of young botanists. You tell people who were, you know, in their 30s or younger when the Origin of Species is published, that would later become um, evolutionists, not because they are looking for a grand theory, but because they are looking for a research project. And they pick up Darwin's research project on flora biology and extend it that they look at other types of species. And this is really, again, very, very sort of powerful. It brings in the other researchers, and particularly younger researchers. And, and so this begins to turn, chain, turn the tide of the reception of Darwin's theory. But I think probably the great moment in all of this, where you can see kind of the symbol of how we is when we get to the kind of 18, the end of the 18, uh, in about 1863 and 1864, there's a movement afoot by Darwin's supporters to get he, to have him awarded the Copley Medal of the August Royal Society. Now, this is before the Nobel Prize, and, and it's probably the most prestigious scientific award in the world. Certainly the most prestigious scientific award in the world. So it's the highest award that the Royal Society, founded in the 17th century, would give. And Darwin's um, Allies wanted Darwin to win the award. The problem they had is the president of the Royal Society, um, Edward Sabine, hated evolution. He didn't want to give Darwin the award. And so he, you know, anybody who's ever been on committees or organizations probably know all of the kind of the machinations you can do, sort of, you know, these internal politics. And, and Sabine so manages to put on, you know, getting Darwin the award. But he acknowledges to one of his friends and allies that by the end of 1863, he can't do it anymore. With all respect for Darwin's great services and recognizing 
that his recent work on orchids must be classed among these, I cannot see without extreme concern the efforts of a very strong party to obtain the award of the common benefit and expressly on the grounds of his conclusions as to the origin of species. Basically, what he's saying is, particularly with orchids, the game's up. You can't keep blackballing this guy. And they don't. By the, the following year, he does win the Copley Medal. A little bit of controversy. Uh, did, did, was Darwin's work on the origin of species included in the citation or not? They fought over that, but it didn't really matter. He won it, and everybody recognized that even if he didn't win it for the origin of species, he won it for his botany in large part, and his botany was driven by his evolutionary theory. And so, one of the things you have is 1863, he's like, oh man, nobody. It's like, there's half a dozen of us. 1868, also to Joseph Hooker, this now almost universal belief on the evolution somehow of species, I think, may be fairly attributed in large part to the origin of the mind years. He went from nobody's on our side to everybody's on our side. And it's true. By 1868, you'd really be hard pressed to find a good naturalist who was still opposing evolution. If you could find them, they would be the so there were a few old guys and kind of Dobin kind of hung on to the end. They died, and that was it. Evolution in some form. Now, natural selection is it's a more complicated question, whether, but uh, that was the universe we accepted. But evolution, evolution was. And a lot of it was not because of any grand sort of metaphysical change in religion. It was quite a simple a point that Darwin was able to show that his theory explained existing patterns no patterns in the natural world, but also provided a platform for continuing new research. And so, from that point, um, Darwin goes from strength to strength. I mean, he publishes 11 more books after the origin of species, um, many, many papers, um, landmarks, all of them in some way in the history of science, from fertilization of plants to earthwork the descent of man, and uh, so on and so forth. I want to talk about um, the preface that Darwin wrote to a, the English translation of a work called The Fertilization of Flowers. So it was written by a German human, Herman Mueller, one of these scientists who picked up his work on plant fertilization. And then by, by uh, when it comes out in 1863, it's this thick compendium because there been so much research being done on this in light of Sir Darwin. And so it made sense that Darwin would write the preface to the, to the uh, English translation. And so I want to read the final paragraph because this really, I think, captures Darwin's spirit. So he, so much of the prep, well, much of the preface, I should say, he was giving kind of like, um, suggestions to researchers. Say, okay, here's a problem we can't solve. Here's another problem. Maybe you guys want to look at this. this is, isn't this cool? And he said, well, I'm not going to make any further suggestions because these will occur in abundance to any young and ardent observer who will study Mueller's work and then observe for himself, giving full play to his imagination, but rigidly checking it and testing each notion experimentally. If he will act in this manner, he will, let me judge by my own experience, receive so much pleasure from his work that he will feel, he will ever afterwards feel grateful to the author and translator of the fertilization of flowers. And so I would want to highlight one, you know, Darwin would say, give full play to your imagination. That science is not some arid pursuit. That you should go out and be creative and push for explanations. However, if you do that, you have to rigidly check everything you do so it's experimental. So let your imagination run wild, then test it. And mostly your imagination will be wrong. You have to be throwing these things out. That's how the science operates. The thing that I love about this one is I think this really captures not just like the spirit of Darwin, but ultimately the spirit of great science. But, but it's the date I find particularly interesting. February 6, 1882. By 8 April, Darwin's dead. This is the last thing that Charles Darwin writes for publication. So get play in your imagination. And tested his girlfriend as a wonderful and sending off for a really remarkable career that ultimately concludes with Darwin's funeral in Westminster Abbey. Where, if you're ever in London, 
Um, I would strongly recommend that you visit Westminster Abbey for many reasons, but to pay respects to Charles Darwin is certainly one. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. We have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers. If anyone would like a question. After the Beagle, it was almost 25 years before we published the Origin. And one of the things that I've heard is that he was, even though it was 25 years, he still was rushed to publish because there was an opposing um, person that would have come up with a similar um, theory that I, I can't remember the, their name right now. But it was yes, thank you. And um, they had looked at the same events happening only in a much smaller area of Southeast um, Asia. Uh, was that part of the reason I published then? And or was why was the reason that it took so long to get to that point? Okay, well, maybe I'll start with why did it take so long for Darwin to get to that point? And historians kind of argue about this. Some people think he was absolutely terrified and, and, and you know, he didn't want to, you know, he didn't want to have all of this anger poured down on his head. I think that's largely wrong. Not entirely, but largely. I think that one of the, Darwin recognized that he was playing with, you know, he was playing with life. But this is that if you're going to have a theory that explains the grand scope of biology, you really need to have it done solid. And so that he spent the time to do, as he said in his, in, 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 to not just to give time for his imagination, but to test everything. And there are so many things to test, so many things that he did test. So in the midst of this, he, um, as I mentioned several times, Joseph Hooker. So he's writing this letter to Joseph Hooker. Hooker is the first person he tells about his theory. Um, kind of jokes, it's like confessing to murder. And so Hooker is not convinced, and at one point Darwin, you know, in this exchange, Darwin says, well, you know, I, I, I need to test this better. And so what he does is, okay, I got this theory, but what does it, how does it correspond to what we actually see in the, in, in the natural world? What classification of species? And so he spends eight years classifying animals. Why? In fact, some people say, you've got the greatest theory in the history of science. Why are you doing something that one day is classifying barnacles? Because by classifying barnacles, he can convince himself he's good and he's right or he's wrong. And if I classify barnacles, he convinces himself that he was right. So that's a huge chunk of time, but he was 80 years classifying those barnacles. In fact, it came to the point where his, you know, his young children would go over to their friend's house and say, where did your father keep his barnacles? So that the whole family was organized around them. Um, he finishes the article work, and he decides that he's going to write a three-volume door stopper to explain all of his ideas. Like, you know, we're talking probably 1,500 pages, an immense undertaking, and he's working on that. When he gets this letter from Alfred Russell Wallace, a uh, younger naturalist who was doing work at the time in the modern days of Indonesia, who sets out a theory very similar to his own. Um, he says to Darwin, he thinks this is good to pass this on to a geologist named Charles Wiles. And he thinks Darwin's like, oh my god, he's, this, I, I could hard, this is my theory. So he talks to Hooker, he talks to Wiles, what are you going to do? And the compromise is that both Wallace's theory and Darwin's theory is presented jointly at a major, uh, at a major London meeting of the Linnaean Society. So what this does is it allows Darwin to keep his priority, but without kind of stepping on some of the walls. And then at that point, this is 1858, um, Darwin recognizes that, well, I just can't let this go on a short paper. I don't have time to finish my big three volume book. Thank God, said Joseph Walker, said, because he said it would choke every naturalist of the 19th century. And instead, he writes this abstract, which is run on all side of And so he never actually does write his big book. Um, it gets subsumed by the You, uh, you touched on uh, uh, geology a little bit, but I'm wondering how much, um, 
Christianity was known at that time, and it, I'm not sure how aware of Darwin of sort of our modern understanding of theology, kind of etc. Uh, and did that play at all to his race? Oh yeah, yeah, Darwin was deeply immersed in geology. In fact, if Darwin would have died, say, in I don't know, 1848, then, uh, he would be remembered as a geologist. In fact, when um, John Herschel, who I mentioned, was editing a book called The Admiralty Manual, basically to provide naval officers and others with, with information on how to do science, Darwin wrote the chapter on geology. So, so one Darwin, was um, deeply immersed in geology. He was very closely tied into the networks of leading geologists. And geology was one of the great sciences, was one of the great sciences, sciences of the first half of the 19th century. We see this revolution in the understanding of the Earth. The Earth is old. You understood the, um, the patterns of how you can see the strata being created. You see the uh, geological maps. You saw the first um, explosion of, what you, of kind of religion of, of religious objections. I mean, because when Darwin comes back in the middle of the thirties, there were a lot of people condemning geology for throwing out the chronology of Genesis, and so Darwin was um, part of the group that of chronology of Genesis, as did the Reverend. Adam Sedgwick, his mentor in Cambridge, with Reverend William Buckland and, and, and others. And so, yeah, the, the geology was incredibly sophisticated. Darwin knew about it. Sure, how much I read or maybe I saw the movie so many facts in the previous six that Darwin's father, he was a very devout, or he was uh, a man of love himself. And, he opposed Darwin going on that field trip, and he also, uh, I think I've read that Darwin had some, some problems uh, with or I think he wanted to publish. Or we don't have to publish. Yeah, well, his father wasn't particularly about. In fact, his grandfather, Horace's daughter, was kind of famous in the in the 18th century. His father, um, like his grandfather, was a doctor, not a clergyman. His father would have been kind of concerned more about his relationship with his social connections than he would have been, you know, uh, kind of thumbing the Bible. He did try to push Darwin into becoming a clergyman. So that's why Darwin, actually, Darwin was originally going to train to be a doctor. Uh, he goes to University of Edinburgh and he washes out there for various reasons. He goes to Cambridge with the idea that he's going to become a clergyman because it's, it's socially respectable. It's the type of thing if you want to potter around with your, and collect your beetles, well, a clergyman is a pretty good, you know, give your sermons on Sunday, you go out on Monday and, and, and do your collecting, right? So that, you know, but the, so Darwin never obviously had a deep calling for religion, but it, well, he never at the same time was, never had like this moment where he's looking at well, certainly by the time in the legal boy, she was sort of moving away from that for, for, for various reasons. Now, his father didn't want him to go on the legal, mostly because he's, he saw he was worried about his son becoming essentially a losing loser. I mean, that maybe, um, he was worried that, that Darwin would drift and would never do anything with his life and spending time kind of monkeying around with this animal he didn't see a particularly good use of his time and he could be doing other things more productive. Um, Darwin went to his uncle, his uncle then went to his father, talked to his father, and did it. His father not only got him to go, but crucially sort of banged. So, you know, Darwin, he was nobody hired him to do this. He went entirely on his father's part. Probably the more interesting thing, I think, if you want to see a relationship between uh, kind of religious faith and his ideas between Darwin and his very devout wife. And they, but they managed to make a comment. Question is to listen. Uh, I wonder if the way he preaches and how it's in the Quran. Yes, uh, the Quran is very similar to the Bible in that sense. The stories are very similar. So there are creations that come to the Quran. And there are also uh, scholars who claim that uh, they can find the evolution of the Quran. 
actually in the last conference, the social conference we had in October, the title of Sound Science, Can They Coexist? We had one speaker who had a total theory of evolution from a standard perspective. Uh, how, how effective is that or how accurate is you know, the open for opinion? But yes, it is uh, definitely a question. And one other question. Where, where is Darwin in that picture? Oh, <laughs> um, he's where I don't know where he is. He's the castle. He's dead. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is a super. It, it's buried in Westminster Abbey. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this was. I mean, and, and this is about one of the highest honors you can get, of course, if you're in English, is to be buried in Westminster Abbey. Um, within a few feet, one, actually, he's buried right next to John Herschel, who I mentioned. He's buried uh, adjacent to Isaac Newton. So this is. Um, and I would actually say one thing, you know, about kind of creationism and biblical liberalism. Now, there were biblical literalist attacks on Darwin during his lifetime, but for the most part, biblical literalism in Britain was a spent show. You know, they, they tried to attack geology and it didn't work. And so very few of the most important critics of Darwin would have attacked him on biblical literalist grounds. There have been other religious grounds to do it. Like um, Bishop uh, Wilberforce was not a biblical literalist. He would not and did not attack Darwin. Was he still alive when the um, survival of, his, of the fittest kind of theory was going around in business to justify why the white race or those um, were higher than what was perceived as the lower races and it was a perversion of, of uh, of Darwin, but was he still alive and did he have a reaction to that? Um, yeah, he had a reaction to it. I mean, one of his letters, he kind of noted a little ruefully that people are using his theory to justify the bad business practices of dishonest Manchester businessmen. So he was aware of that. On the other hand, he, uh, when you talk about the issues of race, if Darwin's views on race are abhorrent, I mean, so you might like to think that these are this, that the idea that there are hierarchies of races and the whites are on top, and, and you think that's a distortion of Darwinism? Well, I, I would certainly say it's unscientific, but it's an unscientific view that Darwin himself subscribed to. Similarly, in the sense of man, um, his his uh, explanation of what we could call sexual dimorphism in humans, difference between men. Uh, not, uh, you know, from a modern scientific point of view or a modern social point of view, again, these are incredibly sort of retrograde to the white face. And so Darwin, I mean, I, I deeply admire Darwin, but Darwin was a, was a man of his time, and like a man of his time, he had a lot of views that were pernicious. Uh, just a follow up question inspired by, the, by this uh, photo that uh, did, did the clergy the have a problem with Birmingham and Westminster with the influence to the uh, you know, eulogy or the religious ceremony? Okay, uh, I did not set this question up, but I was prepared for it. <laughs> um, this, is the, um, this is the eulogy given at Darwin too by the Reverend George Farrell, who was one of Queen Victoria's chaplains. And he, he preached that Darwin was the greatest man of science of his day, but he was so entirely a stranger to intellectual pride and arrogance that he stated with the utmost modesty opinions of the truth of which he himself was convinced, but which he was aware could not be universally agreeable or acceptable. I love this bit. Surely in such a man lived the charity, which is the very essence of the true spirit of Christ. And so, by the time Darwin is, dies, the Church of England, for the most part, had long since made its peace. And the Church of England was, during the course of the 19th century, kind of riven with all sorts of, of different sort of parties. I mean, 
The Church of England was spent much of the 19th century in a low rate civil war. So it's not everyone in the Church of England made a peace with Darwin, but for the most part, they did. And Prothero's reaction isn't just the words of somebody who has to say nice because the guy is lying dead and cast it before you. You see other types of sermons, other people saying from the Church of England, um, much, you know, making uh, similar types of, of claims. And so it was not controversial to get Darwin in Westminster Abbey, despite what you, you, might, you might think. Okay. We can take one more question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, this is a little bit out of focus, but you are interested in the history of science and the uh, um, mention of Alfred Russell Wallace just kind of brings to mind, you know, the great men theory of, of history, particularly the history of ideas, you know, Newton and Leibniz and Byte, we were in the at the same time. Um, we would have eventually learned to fly without the right brothers. Some ideas, Arise when the time has come, you know, and it could be argued that they've been independent of their discoverers, because if not him, then someone else. It, you know, the Erasmus Darwin, and some of his holdings had kind of the germ of, you know, what. Yeah, you know, he was a lot of that in the years. Um, I guess my question is just how do you feel about that? Oh, well, I agree entirely. I mean, what if I love kind of these Darwin days and celebration of Darwin, but I think there's a whole range of different exciting things you can attached to this person's biography, but I think it can, I, I think it does kind of distort our understanding of the history when we give so much credence to one sort of individual. I mean, and, and Darwin himself would be the first to admit this, that he was part of this larger community and that he was building upon the research and the ideas and the collaboration and sometimes the conflict with a whole brain of other people. And in fact, one of the criticisms I would make um, even because they the are world, I think this is as true as, as it may have been 20 years ago. But I think that a lot of times we don't even understand Darwin as well as we should. Because by focusing entirely on Darwin, we miss what his friend Joseph Booker is doing. I wrote my dissertation on Joseph Booker. And I got one of the things that I did is I got so frustrated. You go into the index of a book on, on Darwin, and Booker would be you know, all over the place. Every time you go there, it would be known as Darwin said the book. Because Darwin broke the book. And, and, and so you almost got the impression that Joseph Booker was some type of violent cat. And shot into the right hands. And my question is, well, what, what was Booker interested in? What was Booker saying back? Why did Booker care? And then I think uh, once we did that, one, we got a deeper understanding of the, of the environment in which Darwin was operating. But also, I think you understood Darwin then. Because again, it wasn't just filing things in this passive individual. Hooker was pushing back and forcing them in, in, in certain directions. And I think to understand science as a you know as a community, not just as a few kind of marquee names. And I would also say, and this is really important, one of the things that you see in history of science is only recently is you see kind of the acknowledgement of the contribution of women. And some of this is because, you know, not all because women were excluded. <coughs> weren't excluded. I mean, they, they weren't ever allowed, you know, very rarely it ever would be names on the big books. But if you look at something like Darwin, Darwin was so dependent upon his wife and his daughter. If you look at uh, Joseph Hooker. His, he, I mean, his, he, he writes to his grandfather, why am I proposing this? Basically, he, he, he describes a research assistant. She can correct the proofs and she knows a lot. You know, yeah, by the way, I'm kind of smitten. Kind of as an actor, afterthought. And so if you open it up, you can see a whole range of contributions that are absolutely essential to the production of natural knowledge that get buried if you only look at you know, a handful of things. And Rosalind Franklin was robbed. And Rosalind Franklin, right. Yeah, that, that was certainly. Um, um, in terms of Boston Crick getting access to unpublished sort of data and, and the, the development of their, of their model of DNA. Thank you very much, Dr.
Thank you for listening to Muslimish Free Thinkers. Do let us know what you think of this episode at facebook.com forward slash Muslimish. Don't forget to visit us at muslimish.org.